retired U.S. Air Force Major Margaret, but we're going to call her Margie, uh, Witt will help us explore issues related to equity and access in the military. Major Witt reshaped, helped reshape history and the military stance on gays serving in the military through her legal challenge of the don't ask, don't tell policy. Just eight years ago, Major Witt and thousands more military service men and women could be discharged because of their sexual orientation. Today, eight years later, there's new conversations about who has the right to join the military with regard to transgender populations. So tonight, through a guided conversation facilitated by our own KLCC's Tiffany Eckert, we'll talk about issues of access and advocacy through Major Witt's own personal story. Later in the program, you will have the opportunity to ask questions. Now it is my great pleasure to invite KLCC's Tiffany Eckert and guest speaker, Major Margie Witt. Thank you. Thank you, President Hamilton. It's good to see everybody. Um, so I want to begin with a quite pivotal question. Um, w at what point in your life did you know um, that you wanted to be a nurse? Whew. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> thought we were gonna start right out with it. Okay, good one. Um, that I wanted to be a nurse. Well, was it the first time I bandaged the dog? Or, um, we, you know, that was, cute story. You, want, you, want, you want the flight nurse story or the nurse story? The flight nurse story? So when you were with story. your family playing I Spy in the car? Oh, yes, okay. I, uh, because I, I, I knew what a nurse was, but I didn't know what a flight nurse was. Oh, okay. And we um, used to drive out uh, around the backside of McCord. My family was very, they're all Pacific Lutheran University graduates and my uncle was a professor there. And so we would go out quite often to PLU and we, we would go around the backside of McCord. And I was, pretty, I was pretty little, maybe five or so, maybe even younger. And the big game was to spot the big white plane with the red cross on the tail. Because occasionally, the medevac crews from the Air Force would fly in to McCord and, and stay the night there. And because they would travel across the country, I would find out later. Um, but it was rare. But when that plane was there, it was really exciting. You know, and I would, my brother and sister probably didn't care. They were, Older, but it was a big deal to me to spot the the white plane with the big red tail, big red cross on the tail, mm -hmm. and um, to learn that there was a, a a job that was for flight nurse. I thought that sounded pretty cool. Right, right. And uh, those planes were C nine C nine Nightingale, mm -hmm. Nightingales, Florence Nightingales. Yes. Cool. Um, little did anyone in the car know that you would end up by thirty years old having flown. Thousands of hours uh, in those planes. Yeah, and those in that plane. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, four different aircraft, but thousands. Yeah. You grew up in Washington State. Yeah. Did Tacoma way? Uh, around Tacoma, mm -hmm. um, University Place, and I actually lived on an island. I lived on Fox Island for quite a while. Grew right. up on the island. So. Yeah. Um, had a happy, loving family, playing I Spy and many yep. other things. Yep. Very um, lucky. In your youth pretty young, uh, junior high it seems like um, from, the, from what I read, that um, you saw the way um, people, young people, who uh, your peers who came out uh, as gay were ostracized, um, yeah. sometimes hostily, kicked out of their houses. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's high, even high before school. you yeah. realized that uh, um, your sexual orientation, is that true? Is that yeah, true? yeah. So is that what made it so hard for you to, to come out to your family? Absolutely, one of the reasons. I mean, um, watching what happened to them amongst 
uh, my peers, even the, the church youth group was um, very shunning and watching what parents would say and even even my mother, how she reacted in high school to a, a young woman who was basically outed on the softball team. Um, that's when, and that's when I kind of started, I, I had a name for things and I, I started paying attention, I guess. It opened my eyes to um, hearing how, the hostility towards gay and lesbian people and, and it was um, really shocking to me how, how cruel that people could be. Right. And, and it took a long time and we will get to uh, the point at which you felt comfortable to talk to your uh, parents who loved and supported you. Um, the, when we, we talk about your work, I mean, we gotta move along in your life, um, but that was kind of a, a, a shining moment where you said, oh, I see the way society would treat me once you realized part of who you were, and that really, um, you know, it had an effect. Uh, you get a degree um, from a Lutheran college, and you take a job at a hospital. Yeah, Nova Not, General Hospital. Yeah, same hospital I was born in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. that had some effect on you, like when you yeah. saw your future. I, you what know, did you they, see? Growing up in the same place all the time, and, and I thought that was that's what I wanted to do, you know. And, um, my parents had basically held the same job forever, and I thought that was the whole thing. And then I started to panic a little bit when I realized how happy and happy the people that had been there for over 30 years were. <laughs> and I thought, maybe this isn't, this isn't it. Maybe there's more. Right. There's got to be more. Yeah. So you're thinking more. The only way yeah. you can really do the thing that you're really into doing, um, becoming a flight nurse, means uh, I better join the military. Yeah, well, I, um, I had, had friends that were trying to get me to join the military, even in, even in college, and um, it, it's one of, my, one of my regrets is that I didn't accept an ROTC position, because at that age in college, you think five years, I could never possibly owe anyone five years of my life, because that's a lifetime. Little had I known, I really could have saved a lot of cash. Um, but I had I had friends that were in ROTC, and I had uh, one of my best friends went to West Point, and I went to her graduation. I learned more about the military, and um, I had a lot of respect for those women. Um, they were amazing, intelligent, strong, really good friends of mine, and um, they kept saying, "You know, you could do this, and you could do the same job," and it, and it it dawned on me, I could do the same job. And to me, it would have so much more meaning to do it um, for my country and to serve those who were willing, you know, possibly to make the ultimate sacrifice. Um, it, it gave it that much more depth to me with that mission. So Groucho Marx once said, I would never join a club that would have me as a member, right? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> You uh, signed up knowing that the club, the military, uh, didn't want the real self, you, as a member. Yes and no. Um, I, I, I dated men, I dated women, I didn't want to label myself, I didn't want to be thrown under one label. Um, definitely did I, you know, question, yeah. Um, did I feel that maybe I wasn't wanted in the military? I, I didn't really feel that way. I thought, you know, I want I want to serve and I want to I want to be a I want to be a nurse in the military. So no no uh, concerns right up front in terms of your enlisting. That wasn't but an afterthought that. Um. You know, it, it crossed my mind. It definitely crossed my mind, but I thought, you know, I'm gonna do my job, and um, it really shouldn't matter. Yeah, well, <laughs> it did. Evidently. And yeah, Mattered and for more some. reasons than just that. Um, yeah. yeah. Had you not joined, we wouldn't be sitting here today. No, not so much. Right? But it is nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> 
great things have come. Right. Yeah. Well, once in, uh, you were in very cohesive units. Yes. Um, yes. Well, I was an operating room nurse and a, and a flight nurse, and, and you have teams where, that you work very closely with. Um, and, you know, all, all the unit members, you have to, you don't stay in it with the same team all the time. You have to get along with everybody and spend a lot of time together. Right, right. In pretty intense situations. Mm -hmm. And in ad addition to in the work, the, you had some pretty harrowing experiences um, that I, I want to touch on because I've found it just so amazing that um, y in the first year, I think, that you were at, Cass at um, uh, Castle, Castle, Base Force Castle Base, in, yeah. in California. Um, so go with me. So it was 88, I think, that there was this mysterious physician's assistant. Oh. Remember that guy? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I remember that guy. Right. So yeah. you, were, you were approached and asked for uh, dates by men. Sometimes you just met them, and then they'd be yelling, like, you want to go out? Which, and... I, yeah, in fact, I, I, I met him actually with a, a group of hospital folks. Um, I was introduced to him at the officers' club. So yeah, um, that was well. Elaborate on that because you know. So he asked you out, and you're like, uh, talk about yeah, what I it felt like. I like. was set up a little bit because I ended up, and people always said it was too nice. Well, I ended up chatting with him, and everybody else kind of went home. And he, he had wanted to go to a movie, and other people were going to go, and then they decided not to. And I couldn't think of a good enough reason not to go. Um, so I went, but I, I let him pick me up, and we, we went to the movie. And he had, he had told the story. He was wearing his wedding ring, and I was like, so what's that? He told this really sad story about his losing his wife in, um, in an accident to a drunk driver and I thought oh okay, okay. I'll go to I'll go to this movie with you um, and uh, it was really it was comical and not comical he tries to put his arm around me don't even know this guy spills his coke all over me <laughs> smooth guy yeah um, so I just want to like get home and luckily we're getting we get Get to the door, and I, I'm like, I gotta be home like by ten because my mom calls because that's when the phone rates go down. So um, <laughs> I know that phone's gonna ring, so right. I need to be home. Or my mom is gonna worry about me. So luckily, just as I'm opening the door and he's trying to push his way in behind me, the phone rings, and I'm like, gotta go. <laughs> and only to find out later because I get called out of a, a meeting that I'm running in the hospital because I had I asked around about this guy. He was supposed to be a PA in the hospital there doing some kind of filling work. And um, pulls me out of this meeting, and I just, I, I told him, you know, no, I don't know who you are, but nobody knows who you are, and um, you're really rude, and you need to go away. Then, then. <laughs> then, I don't know, it was, I don't know how long later, um, the hospital commander comes in and talks to my supervisor, and um, they come out and look at me, and they say, you need to, um, you could dress in civilian clothes, and you need to go over to the parking lot. And they're grinning, they're smiling at me. And they're like, you need to go over to the parking lot over at the, at the, at the base exchange. And um, there's a surprise waiting there for you. You're going to meet somebody. I'm like, a surprise? I'm like, is my family here? Why would I have to change into civilian clothes? So um, my mind's just reeling. And of course, I, I go over and I'm sitting in the parking lot. I'm like, OK, it's not even open yet. And I'm just sitting in this parking lot. This little blue military car comes in circles behind me. And I see the so-called PA sitting in the passenger seat. Then the driver gets out, and he's got the suit. I'm like, this is it. And he comes around and says, um, Lieutenant Witt, mm-hmm, will you come with us? And I thought, this is it. It's all over. Going down. You thought, this is it. All over. They're coming for me. They're coming me. for me. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Who was it? It was the OSI. Yeah. And they actually, um, I was still in uniform because I didn't have anything else besides scrubs. So they drove me all the way, like an hour away to Fresno um, in their car, uh, talking to me and took me to breakfast 
all under the guise of um, helping them out with uh, drug information and controlled substances that um, nurses and anesthesia had access to right. and any kind of drug activity. They gave me their card and said, um, you know, you can't tell anybody we talked to you. Yeah, the, and so uh, again, this the, the organization okay. you speak of. This is the Office of Special Investigation. Yes, OSI, known yeah. for taking kind of down Gestapo y kind of yeah. feeling yeah. you got there. Yeah, um, I want to just without making light of it, but there was another later that year. Um, you reticently accepted another date with a guy who wanted to feed you Cajun food. Um, that ended up. I should have uh, were up dating a long time ago. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. I, were, I didn't know that if you had dinner, you know, you yeah. would be sexually assaulted. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Um, did you feel that you were heard after those instances? Do you feel like you were kind of left ha hanging out there, or well, I didn't. I any? didn't really. I didn't tell anybody. Okay. I didn't tell. Uh, no, because that opens a whole other can of worms. And and this same guy, he lived in this apartment complex that a gal I was dating lived in. So he started throwing comments across the courtyard, you know, calling and calling me all kinds of names. So, I mean, it's, I wasn't going to bring attention to the issue. Right. <laughs> right, because anyone um, could yeah. then turn that into a direct threat to you An and your future. Yeah, and this is before Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So, yeah. 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 You put up walls, you started to really kind of, at a certain point, uh, you write, be a little bit more detached to protect yourself. Absolutely, yeah. And um, get then, military life and personal life completely separate. Um, then there was a, a point at which a young girl, a young service woman, very young, Tammy. Tammy, yeah, yeah. Was reaching out to you, probably for mentorship. Yeah, she was a, a young enlisted gal um, that I, I played basketball with, and you know, um, there were maybe two officers on the on the team, and it's always difficult because you're not supposed to patronize officer and enlisted. Um, and I was really trying to up, uphold that mm -hmm. that standard and really kind of keep her at a distance because she she just really wanted to to be my friend and. Um, she was a security police officer and at the at the front gate, you know. I mean, she wanted to polish my boots and make them shine like hers, you know. And I would, um, I came in the gate once, and the gate guard brings out this stuffed animal, and I'm like, oh no, <laughs> no. Um, so she's giving me this gift. She's giving me gifts, and I'm like, oh no. And I just, I just kept. Keeping her at this distance, it's got to, you know, you're enlisted, I'm, I'm an officer, I can't, I can't hang out with you, I can't be around you, and, you know, there was no interest there, you know, we were friends, and we, we played ball together, but um, she was, uh, she was a, a, a great gal, um, and then it was uh, later, after basketball season, a couple of the players came to my, they found me at my apartment, and and um, they said that she had been um, killed in a head-on on the highway. Sorry, Whew. haven't talked about this in a while. Um, I felt horrible. So what I want to get to is that you felt horrible and you could have felt very guilty too, but you turn that into some kind of a resolve, it, it, it seems to me. Uh, you remember what you said to yourself at a certain point you said yeah um i mean i i believe in the in the officership and i and the fraternization issue but i didn't have to put up that wall so so strong and i didn't have to keep her at such a distance and um i decided i wasn't going to treat uh any enlisted like that ever again, even if they wanted to be friends with me, I, I could, Yeah, it was just, it was an eye-opening moment, because. Regardless of whether you, a great they, young you were a target, and yeah. you, yeah, you thought was, they were coming for you. Yeah, I was trying to protect you. myself. Yeah. You were a decorated frontline uh, flight nurse. 
You were the poster girl for Air Force recruitment. <laughs> Isn't that Is funny? your beaming Isn't that funny? face. Right I think on that the was brochure. part of their whole diversity program. <laughs> That's the cross. Because we were all covered in those pamphlets, yeah. Cross into the blue. Yeah. Um, so, cross you know, into the blue. <laughs> would you call yourself an overachiever, or should I just do that? <laughs> no? Um, yeah. yeah, it may have always been a little bit of an overachiever. Maybe combined with a little ADD. I don't know. <laughs> well, you um, achieved love. When did you fall in love with Lori? Oh, my wife Lori my wife is Lori. here. Um, I actually, I had gotten off active duty and I went back to uh, get my master's in physical therapy. And after I graduated from from that, I met Lori when I worked with the physical therapy department uh, in the school district in Spokane. Um, I had no idea she had any interest in me whatsoever. And here we are today, 15 years later. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Um, being that we, you were moving toward, you'd um, left active duty, gone into reserves, and uh, were a reservist. And then come around, you know, uh, 1993, everyone in the military was living under don't ask, don't tell. Yeah, as of 1993. I was still on active duty. I went to reserves about 96. So, so don't ask, don't tell. I did on. Will you t describe what it is that you, th how you um, saw that don't ask, law? Don't tell. Right. Um, uh, how it affected you and or, you know, its effects on others. Well, I think the general consensus, and, and we all thought it was policy, not an actual law, mm -hmm. um, but um, the general belief was that, yes, you could continue to serve um, as long as you didn't tell anybody and nobody asked you. And, um, man, did we find out that w there was a, a whole different spin on that. The law actually uh, meant that not only could you not tell, you could not have told anyone in your entire life, ever. And um, it didn't have to be just you telling, it could be anybody telling. Anybody could pick up the phone, send an email. And then you had to prove that you weren't. How do you do that? It was interesting how it happened too, that it was, um, I always attributed it I remember it happening, um, and um, it was always attributed to um, Clinton, Bill Clinton, president at the time, mm -hmm. and to really look into it deeper, uh, he had great plans to open the military to all. He really did, and, and a lot of that was brought about um, because of the, the great publicity for the case of Colonel Greta Kammermeyer from Washington, um, who had basically outed herself during a uh, security clearance investigation f to be the head of the National Guard. Yeah. Um, but let me say, to, she, lie, to lie about it was a crime worth, yeah, you're, she, and you're she in did, prison. And it, it varied over, over the years before Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it varied over the years, and, and you, all, you, went, you had your time in court before Don't Ask, Don't Tell. After Don't Ask, Don't Tell, you just signed a paper and you'd be gone in two weeks. But before, you had your day in court. Everybody had their day, more or less, in, in, at least in a military court. Um, and it was, it was interesting, and I just have to throw this out there because this is one of the really shocking things that I learned after I started going through the ordeal. Um, in 2003, um, there was a, a Supreme Court case that kind of did away with all of the sodomy laws across the country. But... Um, Prior, so prior to Don't Ask, Don't Tell, if you were in a, stationed in a state and you were found to be guilty of being a homosexual, you would, could spend up to five years in Leavenworth, the military penitentiary, federal prison, and then when you got out, you would have to register as a sex offender. That was stunning to me. That is stunning. I thought, how do I tell my mom that? Right. I mean, really. And you still hadn't. Who oh, knew? No. Yeah. No. Um, fourteen thousand, nearly fourteen thousand service men and Just women. Just under don't ask, don't yeah. tell. 
Yeah. We're and left pretty much drummed out of quietly. the military. Quietly. You know, that oh, yeah. two-week deal. Yeah. Gone. Yeah. Try to describe the day you were called in. And it was, it was you. I mean, they told you you were under investigation. Yeah, but I didn't know that going in. Um, my commander came to the door and, and said, Major Witt, can you come with me? And I said, yes, ma'am. Walking down the hall, she's not saying anything. So I said, you know, you're kind of making me nervous. What's going on? Well, we, there's, uh, there's um, an officer here. They're doing an investigation on base, and they just asking some people some questions. And uh, we got to the commander's conference room door. She opened the door, and she kind of nudged me through, and then she closed the door behind me. And I was standing in front of a JAG officer, Major Torum. Uh, he introduced himself. And I, I'm still smiling, thinking, not about me. Um, and his first question was, um, you know, so what's your relationship with so-and-so? What? Yeah, absolutely floored me. I had, I had no idea it was coming. You get into it, and it, one must read the book to really get the background. This is a very, we're tacitly going over all of this because your history is long, and this is a I'm compelling. Old. Oh, no, no. That's what she just said. Just two years older than I am. <laughs> um, but I was a brunette when this started. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I was. Go back. Look at the pictures. I was a brunette. Well, I earned every anyway. one of these. Um, do you want to speak uh, to what it was? how it, it came down that that someone basically told a, a superior a superior yeah an email about your personal <laughs> life yeah, do well, you want to elaborate on that it's quite it's quite a lengthy story um, you want to elaborate in a kind of it actually was fashion. an email to to the the joint chiefs so it came down from the top really yeah so um, it's a little hard to Fight that power chain. Mm -hmm. But it was an individual who, who took that information yeah. to the top. Yeah. Okay. Um, what, what or who compelled you to fight? Yeah, I get asked that question a lot. And, um, well, no, because it, it's really made me think about it. And, and there's, there's a, a lot more to it than just it, it was. I, di I didn't have a second thought not to. Um, I think part of it was seeing other people that had fought before me and, and watching them. Because um, you're rooting for them. Yeah. You never think it's going to be you. But then when they hand you the baton, you do your best with it. But I also think that um, I think the military prepared me in a lot of ways to fight for what was right. Um, and I think my parents um, taught me a lot about fighting for equality and fairness. And, you know, had to fight for a lot of things even just growing up, you know. You can't play ball, you're a girl. Started young, I was kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, though, that the military would have prepared you to fight itself. Absolutely. Yeah. You needed legal counsel. You needed someone to represent you in court. You were. Um, um, yeah, I didn't know how bad you need that. I mean, that's why. <laughs> pretty much needed. Yeah, I didn't, yeah, that's why so many folks left quietly. I mean, how do you fight the military? How do you fight the U.S. government? Um, I could have. This is this is actually this is pivotal to the whole story. This is a great story because the day that I was told I was under investigation, I went out to my car in the parking lot, and. Um, got on my cell phone and called the only attorney that I knew. It was a neighbor in Spokane. Um, she had happened to work back in Seattle in the, in the late 80s when um, there's another case going on um, for Sergeant Perry Watkins. Um, and Sergeant Perry Watkins had an attorney named Jim Lobsense who worked with the ACLU on his case, and he won. Um, I didn't know that my neighbor Jan had helped Jim Lobsense because they worked in the same law firm back in the 80s. And she had helped work on that case, volunteered her time. So before I even drove from McCord 
Tacoma home to Spokane. By the time I got home, I had a phone conversation and a meeting set up with one of the top civil rights attorneys in the country. Who does that with one phone call? <laughs> Small world. Well, it gets even smaller because I, I meet with him. He agrees to take the case. Um, if I really understand that it's going to take about 10 years to go through. But um, he then goes to the ACLU again because they had backed him in the, in the case um, 20 years prior with Perry Watkins. Uh, that was before Don't Ask, Don't Tell, obviously. And the ACLU signed on and brought on their, their uh, lead attorney was Sarah Dunn. And Sarah Dunn had gone to law school in Chicago and had a law professor named Barack Obama who covered the Perry Watkins case. So she had the president teach her how to fight. Yeah. I mean, really. Very small. Who does that? That's amazing. Who does that? I so hear you. when you know, right? I was extremely fortunate. Nobody can afford to do this. Nobody. I. It's amazing to me how it, it all absolutely fell into place, and they were wonderful. I was so lucky. How could I not carry that baton, and just to even try to save one person's career? If, yeah. You needed lawyers, um, and you needed to tell your parents. Oh, that, yeah. yeah. I got the lawyers first. You got the lawyers first. I did. Right? OK. OK. And then? So I do procrastinate about some things. Um, yeah, well, it, it, it took a while for the military to figure out um, to actually stop me from serving and to actually f file the paperwork. Um, so that we could file a case. Until they actually said, you're going to be discharged, we could not file the case. So it was that took a couple of years to get that far. Um, and so I had to make sure, because the next day we were going to file the case, and there was going to be a, f a press conference. I thought maybe they should know from me before that. So. I didn't want to hear it on the news from you know one of the broadcasters I'd grown up listening to. Um, so I had planned to have my sister meet me at their house. And I had a friend wait, who had picked me up at the airport who was waiting in a car with a big bottle of scotch to take me away if things went bad. Just in case. Just in case. Mm -hmm. um, things didn't go bad, though, did they? It was amazing, you know. Uh, I I had I had just so feared, uh, mostly just disappointing them. That could be part of that overachiever thing. Um, I I never wanted to disappoint them, and I knew that this wasn't something that was really top on their list for their daughter to do. And uh, so I, I I think I I just said, you know. Um, and I just went right to it. I said that, that um, they want to discharge me from the Air Force under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, or something similar to that. Um, and my mom just kind of looked across the table like, did she just say what? And my dad looked right at me and he said, you're going to fight it, aren't you? I mean, Military that was it. Man talking that was to it. You. Yeah. You're going to fight it, aren't you? <laughs> You know, they're like in their 80s. You I mean I just didn't want to drop this on them, but evidently, I completely on board. You're gonna fight it. Yeah. And that was it. That yeah. was it. From then on, I had won. Yeah. I had won. I mean, I I had Lori, and I had my I had come out to my parents, and they still love me. So it was like, bring it on. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. yeah. That must have been a weight off. Oh. That, yeah, that was everything. I wasn't afraid. Of, <laughs> I wasn't afraid of disappointing the Air Force. Mm -mm. Once you got underway, and again, this took years. This was not a. This was not something that happened um, quickly. It took a lot of your time. And um, 
but the effort uh, to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and, and, and ultimately that was what it was about. It was really um, ju seeking justice as well, though. Um, there were unexpected moments, and I love this part, and I hope that you could re remember what it felt like to have um, so many members of your unit come and testify uh. on your behalf and talk about you in the ways that they did. And it was uh, probably pretty shocking was, to the military attorneys. It, <laughs> it, it was like um, being at your own funeral. Yeah. It, it really was. I mean, uh, I, they're my heroes. Um, because, you know, for a week and a half, they came in day after day taking the stand, some even in uniform. And, and they were there for me, but they were there for all of us because they, they were taking a stand. They were taking the stand for what was right. Yeah. And it was pretty amazing. Um, and somewhat of a risk, although you were in the, you were in the hot seat, but they were there to uh, speak the truth. And it ultimately came, it meant everything uh, to the case. Did it not? Yeah, well, because, because this Don't Ask, Don't Tell thing, yeah. was uh, their complete argument. I mean, their only argument that was because Gay equals negative effect on unit cohesion and morale. And that's kind of, I mean, really? You're going to argue that one in my case? Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, no. Yeah. The judge heard so. it. Yeah. And there's so much interesting stuff about Judge Layton. Judge Layton, that's oh. That's just a Yeah, story it's a really great part in the book about Judge Layton, who, who heard the case actually twice. First time um, in... Uh, the local federal court in Tacoma, and then when it came back, instead of going to the Supreme Court, it came back down to his courtroom, and he was waiting for it. Yeah, the yeah, story it, that just that part of it is just so. He interesting. did a great interview for the book. Tim yeah. did a great job with, with interviewing him. Yeah, yes. it's a really cool part. Yeah, I learned way too much about the law. Never wanted to know <laughs> that much. And in fact, you are now a standard. How does that feel? The wit standard All my uh, as the Ninth Circuit point. panel. <laughs> they laugh hard. Can you qu they quickly know mention? What, I mean, can you kind of in layperson's terms? The wit standard. Terms? It basically says that because they couldn't prove that um, I affected unit cohesion and morale in a negative way, that's what basically won the case because that's what they had to come back and prove. That and and it the to uphold the wit standard. They had to prove that over and over again for each person. Is basically how, how I understand it. Yeah. Um, where's my light? Where's my legal person? Irony. There she is. Um, so, yeah, the wit standard. The wit standard. Um, that's there. Makes, it is. Makes me laugh um, every time. You got the call after so much work and time that you. And it basically was over the phone. You and Lori are standing outside the school, and you hear. Oh, that was the that was the Ninth Circuit one. That was before the last one. That was the we won. Yeah, that, that, yeah, was, that was the very Ninth pivotal. Circuit we won. Yeah. Very crucial. But the two week trial was a was two years later. Two years, years later. later. Yeah. Two years later. Yeah. All these years and all the work um, and the struggle. But there was a point at which you were able to stand next to President. Barack Obama, as he signed the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Yeah, Did you get the pen? Was, I didn't get the pen. You didn't get the pen? No, I didn't what? get the pen, but you know what? What? I came home one day, and on my porch is this big envelope with all the return address said was the White House. And they had sent me um, actual uh, copy of the bill that he signed. So I have a copy of the of the actual bill repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Very significant. It's really cool. I know people have questions. I'm, I'm hoping that you do. I have more, um, but I want to include as many people as possible. Um, I really am interested in hearing um, from Major Witt on um, your take on what, how the what, what do you think the climate is today, uh, these years later, 
and especially given where we are with regard to the most recent uh, attempts to ban transgenders in the military is just another yeah you know, it's another direction um, um, would should, I'd be happy would to you like to elaborate I, on that yeah and then we I can would open be happy to, to um, first of all my, my heart goes out to all the military members at, at this time um, one thing that you want to feel as, as a soldier is that you have faith in your leadership and I don't know that they're feeling that right now. Um, so my, my heart goes out to them and I have, I have faith in those generals to do the right thing for this country and for the world. Mm -hmm. um, and you kind of have to hold on to that. Uh, what I have a real problem with is, is, is rolling back um, promises, rolling back policies, uh, for those transgender troops, I mean, there there are service members who happen to be transgender, and they have been there serving this country. Um, and you know, we had to undergo all the research, and and had to be okayed by a policy and go to go through in order to for them to serve as their authentic selves and and receive the same care that every other service member receives. Um, to deserve that. Um, so to have open service and have no effects, just like when Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed, there was no big tsunami that came through. Um, to have, you know, the most important thing for the service members is to be focused on their mission and focused on their job. And um, the whole idea is, is that you have this military family where, you, you know, you know your family's taken care of, and they were given that opportunity to be on that same level as their service members to have their families taken care of, and um, to be recognized as a whole person and a service member. And now that they've been allowed to do that, it's like, it's like they, they're, they're fish that have been put in a barrel, and now they have a label and now we're going to take a shot at them. And it's the same thing with, as with Don't Ask, Don't Tell. You're fine to serve today. But oh yeah, you've got this label and we're a little bit uncomfortable with this label. And everything that falls under this label doesn't... It, a label doesn't make the person. Um, and that's a bit... No, I won't... Okay. The label doesn't, it's not this blanket cover. And that's kind of what we had to prove in my case, too. So fine yesterday, got this label, we're deciding to go after you today, now that you're an open target. And so these folks don't know what's going to happen in the future. They don't know if, if they're deployed, if they're going to be deployed, what's going to happen to their family, what kind of a discharge might they receive down the road. The service member next to them now doesn't know if that person's going to be there to, to do their job right. the next day. So you want to talk about affecting unit cohesion and morale in a negative way. Pull that unit member out, out of that unit, and leave that hole and see how that affects everybody around them. I mean, that tweet, and every time it comes out, it, it it humiliates, it dehumanizes, and, and it, 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 it disrupts exactly what we're trying not to do. I mean, it's just, sorry. It just, sounds like we are going to be needing a new standard there, <sighs> right? Man, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I have uh, much more, but I would love uh, for folks to, if anyone has a question, yeah, I welcome like the audience to. Okay. Yep. Anybody? Well, as a former military man, thank you for your service. I love the spit shine shoes that you're wearing. They look great after all these years. You still got the touch. I'd like to say, uh, see, I want to call her ma'am because I'm a former non commissioned officer. She's an officer. So please, if I call you ma'am, just accept that I'm still culturized in that. 
I was in the infantry. And I noticed that from 83 to 95. And I noticed that when we ent when I joined the army that that this policy of, of homosexuality being illegal, it was something that was really enforced more on women than it was on men, and against women than it was on men. And That's it, back, yeah. in my very first assignment was 101st, and we, two of our three platoon sergeants were survivors of Hamburger Hill. Mm. And one of them was homosexual, but he was a proven warrior, proven warrior, purple hearts, bronze, silver star, all of the, no one questioned, no one cared about his sexuality because he was a proven warrior. We had other homosexual soldiers in our unit, and I, I, I think it comes down to, from my experiences, w could they do the job? Were they prepared to go the distance to perform, to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic? Uh, that's how we, we judged them. Uh, with this, to, con to confirm and concur with you, what would affect morale is to extract that person yeah. when you become a team, when you've learned to rely on one another, and when you've learned to depend on one another. I, I don't know if I really have a question, as I just wanted to make the comment, ma'am, that having walked that military life, having seen this battle sometimes of the homosexuality being illegal, I, I can say that it was definitely enforced rigorously against women more so than it ever was against men. And when I was at Fort Sam Houston, I had several soldiers who had AIDS. And the, they would tell me, Sergeant Molina, you gotta be careful. The military is developing a policy. You can't touch them. If you touch them, you're gonna get AIDS. So you gotta be very, very careful. And, and as a leader, you didn't know what to do. And so there's a lot of compelling Mis messaging, you know, confusing messaging around these issues. I can tell just by looking at you and listening to you, you're, it's, you're a leader. And military service is about leadership. And military service is about will you stay your foxhole, so to speak, metaphorically, if you're required? Will you stand your post? Our first general order, I will guard everything within the limits of my post and quit my post only when properly relieved. And there's no pre-qualifying factor on sex or any of those other things. Do you have the tenacity to stand your post? Um, I, I just wanted to say all those things to concur. I don't know if I had a question as much as I wanted to say in front of those here that may have never served in the military that I know from my experience, experiences that it was significantly harder on women it was significantly more challenging for them to have a sense of fair opportunity and or a sense of fair play. And I, I was in an admin unit at Fort Lewis, and my female company commander was a, a homosexual, if that's the right term. I don't, I'm, I'm afraid, what to, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> Me was, too, I can't keep up these days. <laughs> but go ahead, go ahead. She was a great leader, and nobody <laughs> cared because she was a great leader, because she did her job. And so I know that if someone went to the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, to, to out you, so to speak. I know that it was very personal. It was meant to cause you uh, damage, and it was meant to cause you harm and to ruin your career. So i just like to apologize to you, to you for whoever did that. Instead of judging you by your skills and your qualifications and your capacities, because it's very obvious that you were more than qualified to be an officer in the military and to fulfill any assignment that you have. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say that. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And thank you for your service. Um, my father was an infantryman in World War II. So thank you. Yeah, first off, thank you very much again for your service, ma'am. Um, my question is in regards to the current climate. And what I'm wondering are your thoughts on, with the repeal of DOT, uh, don't ask, don't tell. Um, did that have any influence on allowing women into combat positions and what we're seeing now with an opening of certain jobs with the military? That's a good question. Um, I don't know that I can really formally answer how much it had to do with it. Um, I think it definitely <coughs> probably opened the discussion. I know we have a, a lot of good officers working in different uh, committees uh, and 
uh, Colonel Kamelmeyer was actually working with one of the organizations in D.C. for open service for women. So that part I know we had a link to. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think it was the climate and the conversation was able to happen. And I think we had, at the time, uh, leadership willing to take a look at it and make decisions. Oh, excuse me, I'm a cold. I can't Sorry. believe I got through my classes today, but I did. So I'm a chemistry teacher here at LCC, and I had a, um, a student who was just terrific. I loved him to death. He's gay. And he married a lesbian in the military to try to hide their sexual orientation. They both got outed, and they both got kicked out. And anyway, you know, when you're talking about <coughs> the um, situation of trying to prove that the fact that that you're not heterosexual has a detrimental effect on your um, the morale or whatever it is of the people you work with. Did you ever think about your assault and thinking about how heterosexual men have such a detrimental effect on the on the morale of people because of their sexual assault, which apparently is rapid and rampant in the military? Uh, yeah, I, I I thought about a lot of ironic situations. Um, yeah, I, I, I probably thought about that. I also thought about the fact that, you know, we were now allowing felons to serve, but we weren't worried about unit cohesion and morale. <laughs> I mean, it, it, uh, there were so many things that didn't make sense to me, because it didn't make sense in the first place. So it didn't, it didn't do me any good to kind of compare those things, but uh, it just didn't, it didn't make sense to have such a blanket statement and to try to uphold it. Um, and I, I knew people, too, that, that would marry somebody in order to try to stay out of the investigations. Yeah. There was some Good desperate decisions. Uh, let me address just a little bit farther. I'm sorry. Uh, I will so get you. You are Air Force. Um, the, the sexual assault issue. Um, one thing, when, when we, because it, it was before Don't Ask, Don't Tell, during Don't Ask, Don't Tell, you're so into that protective mode, and you have to, you just accept that you're living in that secret world. Um, what I didn't realize in, until talking about it after the fact and later was um, I knew it made me more susceptible to like situations of being blackmailed or something on dates and things like that. Uh, but I didn't realize that the whole policy and having to go through all of that was military sexual trauma. Of having to hide your identity, having couldn't you couldn't be who you were, you had to evade everything, and um, there was a whole discussion that I had with a, a, a military social worker counselor that approached the whole issue of that was military sexual trauma that so many of us went through, or were put through. So that was just one addition I wanted to make to that. I'm sorry. Air Force. Hello again. Uh, I'm just wondering, what would your main bit of advice be should a tweet actually become law and policy, which is weird to say out loud, but should that happen? And should those trans service people be suddenly removed and find themselves you know, uh, just taken out of the, the game? and away from the mission, what would be your main piece of advice to those people as well as the units that want to support them in fighting mm -hmm. the repeal of a tweet? You know, and, that, and that's the tough issue is that you, from within the military, you can't fight, you can't say anything, and you can't speak out and talk against it. Um, so it's just kind of ironic. And, and you rely on other people to do that. And I'd say, um, at least I, I would say, I've got your back um, and continue to speak out. And 
it's like when when the tweet first came out, I was I was doing a lot of radio shows, and I would I would just tell them, you know, keep your head down, keep you know, focus focus on your job, and be the best soldier, airman, coasty, marine that you can be, because that that was why that is why you are where you are. Um, Focus on your job, focus on the mission, and uh, we've got your back. One more question, anyone? I have, I have a question. <laughs> um, uh, I wonder, you obviously have a lot of um, respect and esteem for the military and your military experience, and I guess I wonder, um, how do you reconcile that with um, Having going going through an experience where they, uh, you know, where the military really carried out an injustice against you. Excellent question. Um, because a lot of people ex expect a lot of anger, um, and you know, I I had to search within myself. You know, what what is it that I feel about the military? But I mean, I. I only wanted to get back. I mean, it took a long time for my attorney to calm me down. You know, like, this isn't going to happen, at least for a long time. So um, I, I don't have that, that anger. And it didn't do me any good to hold on to any of that. Um, really, Lori and I would really work on the good things um, that were going on. and. And I can tell you the reason I, I, I wanted to go back in was for the people that I was serving with. This is the part that gets me every time, because somebody always asks. Um, so you know, I can have my feelings towards the, 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 the uh, establishment or the, or the, or the, the faulty law. Um, but I would have gone back. Um, had I not gotten so old, uh, but it's the people that I served with and the people that continue to serve um, that I hold in my heart. It was the best decision I made. I can still say that today. Didn't your attorney say there's no crying in no litigation? No crying in baseball. <laughs> no crying in baseball. Tell me over and over again. No crying in baseball. And, and then he'd say we were only in the second inning. <laughs> <laughs> oh. How many years I had to hold this in? If I may just point <sighs> out, the book is available, and it's very good read. And um, the foreword was written by aforementioned Colonel Camomark. Oh, and uh, she has a story in it, her own. I'm surprised. <laughs> There's not a book with no serving she has in a silence. Couple books. Yeah, oh, the movie too. That's right, right. Book the movie. movie. Oh, Meryl, uh, mm -hmm. uh, who played Glenn her? Glenn Close. Glenn Close. That's right. But in the foreword that that the colonel wrote uh, for this book, I did not know this, and I just wanted to point this out. Maybe as our little closer here. Um, so homosexuality, uh, uh, as she writes, has always been considered in uh, compatible with military service despite the fact that a known homosexual is the creator of American military organization, discipline, training, supply organization, the, this General Friedrich von Steuben mm -hmm. organized the Continental Army effectively enough to win the Revolutionary War. And created okay. the uniform. So, the uniform too. But I mean, at the end of the day, I found that just uh, quite striking that really the United States you know we could all be speaking quite differently and uh, not be right who yeah. the United States of America owes it to a gay man so um, I found that yeah right it's in the first page there. of your book bam um, I thank you so much there's for more taking to us than time. a label yeah right right thank you do you have a hero that you want to go out on who's your hero Military's big on heroes, right? Yeah, well, I was going to say Lori. I would. Okay. I would. Um, I would. Yeah. <laughs> it's a long ride back to Tacoma. To <laughs> um, you can name more than one. 
It was Lincoln when you were little, so you're gonna like the bar is high, you know, because it was that whole slavery thing was so unfair. (laughs) I've learned more about that now. Right. Um, You know, my hero was it. It was Greta Kammermeyer, and she was um, a mentor to me just by her example, in her poise and her leadership. and she's Norwegian too, and she's a nurse too. Mm-hmm. And she's from Washington too. Um, oh, I followed that story really closely, and um, I I admired the way that she handled herself and um, and her honesty. Mm-hmm. She came before you. Oh yeah. And oh you man. And when when I when she I she called me. Did she call me or did I call her? I think she called me and. Um, She's tall. She's like over six feet tall. But, I mean, that comes through on the phone. Because <laughs> she should have been a general. Because, uh-huh. I, I mean, when I heard it was her on the other end of the phone, I stood at attention in the room. So, yeah, she, she's my hero. Excellent. Hope she knew that. She knows now. Good. <laughs> Again, thank you very much for for being here, and to those of you who came, um, I think this was. Uh, thank you fun very much for coming, and thanks for having me here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.